Tonight's movie classic, The Cruel Sea, begins in about 15 minutes, but now we go over to the newsroom and Michael Burke. Rescue teams from all over Britain are heading for the scene of what looks to be Britain's worst air crash tonight. Just after seven this evening, a jumbo jet crashed onto the town of Lockerbie in the Scottish borders. It was a Pan American Boeing 747, flight number 103 from London Heathrow to Kennedy Airport, New York. We now know there were 244 people on board, including three children. It came down on a petrol station and a housing estate on the south side of Lockerbie. There are casualties amongst the townspeople. We don't know how many. Bodies have been found up to two miles away. There's mo no immediate indication of why the plane crashed. Officials say there was no other airplane involved and rule out a mid-air collision. No explanation yet why the plane crashed from 31,000 feet without even time for a mayday message. This is the little border town of Lockerbie tonight. The air is thick with smoke, flames and the smell of aviation fuel. A crater 20 feet deep marks the spot near the main Glasgow road where the jumbo jet came down. Pan Am flight 103 from Heathrow to New York carried 15 crew and 229 passengers. Holidaymakers bound for the States, Americans going home for Christmas. It was just after seven tonight that the first sign things had gone awfully wrong reached flight controllers. At about eight minutes past seven at the Rescue Coordination Centre here at Edinburgh, um, it was reported by the Civil Air Traffic Control Authorities that there had been an explosion on the ground, and this coincided with a Pan Am uh, Boeing 747 disappearing from uh, the radar screens. The jet hit a petrol station, it wrecked houses on the south side of Lockerbie, the fuselage reportedly split in two, and cars on the main Glasgow road were hit by debris. At a hotel in the town, customers heard and saw the crash. We initially heard a rumbling over the hotel. We thought the roof was falling in. And then we heard a tremendous shudder on the ground as though it was an earthquake. And then we saw sparks and then this enormous ball of flame going about two or three hundred feet into the air. There was debris flying everywhere. Some houses on the south side of Lockerbie reportedly all but disappeared. Those whose homes were unhit were mostly making tea at the time of the crash. Well, it was just about seven o'clock we heard this almighty bang and the whole skylight. I was looking out the, in the back kitchen which looks over onto the A74 and it was the sky lit up and I heard this explosion. I realised it was a plane coming down so we just get down on the floor and as soon as we passed over and we got out and we went round about the other houses to get a lot of elderly people staring there so just more or less to get everybody out and see that we're all right. I was driving up the road in the, in the car and uh, you know I heard this horrible sound it was like a rushing and a screaming noise and the whole sky just lit up and then you had it was it was like liquid fire started to rain down in the car and concrete, bits of concrete and debris and we even found a piece of the, um, the, 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 the aluminium bedded in the car. I was, I was just driving home, you know, and then it uh, must have been about 20 past seven. I had me uh, cassette playing in the radio, you know, and I seen this just huge, vast, enormous red glow just lit up everywhere. I was stunned, you know, I, I was nearly going to break the vehicle, you know, but I took it easy and then it must have hung in the air for about two minutes and then this huge flash of flames, big mushroom, you know the way you see uh, these documentaries about bombs dropping and that, that's what it looked like. That's when it hit the ground, you That's when it hit the ground, yeah, I mean, it, it was just vast, you know. You've been up there, what, what do you gather from uh, the situation? Well. I'm 200 yards parked from this place here, which is, must be about a mile and a half from where the carnage is. And we were parked there for about an hour and a half. And then I walked up, uh, I took a look around. It's just total carnage, mayhem, you know, it's never seen nothing like it in my life, never. Rescue services in Lockerbie first took the injured and dead to the town hall where a refugee centre has been set up. There's no word yet on the number of casualties, they're being taken to hospitals including the Dumfries and Galloway Infirmary by ambulance and helicopter. The first have reportedly arrived. 
In other Scottish hospitals, surgeons and blood transfusion services are standing by. This is the latest report we've had from Lockerbie from a BBC reporter. This is where the impact occurred. There's a crater there some 30 yards wide and to the other side of it some 20 or so houses of which just the shells remain. This is the A74, the main Carlisle trunk road. It's collided here and there's about tons and tons of debris blocking the road and even cars strewn across it. People who saw friends and relatives off on the final leg of the flight from Heathrow this evening went back to Terminal 3 at the airport when they heard about the tragedy. They've now been taken to a special reception center in the airport complex and they're being looked after by Pan Am staff. Michael Peshart reports. Staff at the Pan Am desk at Heathrow came straight back to the airport when they heard news of the crash. They have been flooded with calls from anxious relatives. Some of the bereaved have arrived at the airport in the hope of finding out more. They're now being looked after in a room that's been set aside at Heathrow. However, the authorities here are asking those who are concerned to stay at home. There's more chance of finding out information by telephone. There is, I regret to say, very little that we can do, but we have opened up a room here where the relatives and friends of those on board have been gathering, and the best that we can do for them is at least give them a seat and perhaps a cup of tea and get any information that there is going to them as fast as we can. But I would say that the airport in uh, this kind of circumstance does not have a passenger manifest, a list of names. It is only the airline that would have that and it will be up to them when they are able to issue the names of those or if who are involved. Within minutes of news of the crash being released, one man arrived at the airport having just seen his wife off on holiday. He had heard reports of the crash on his car radio. He arrived here to be told there had been no survivors. He's now being comforted by staff. And families and relatives of the American passengers aboard Flight 103 have begun to gather at John F. Kennedy Airport in New York, the Jumbo's destination. A Pan Am spokesman talked to reporters at the airport a few minutes ago. He said it's too soon to speculate on the cause of the crash. We have no indication that there were any problems. There was no contact from the captain or any of the crew members. Uh, there were no problems, no indications whatsoever prior to the flight that there were any problems on board that aircraft or with the machine itself. We, um, if I may now, try to answer any questions that you may have. There's been some suggestion there was an explosion in midair. We really don't. We have no indication. As I said, there was no prior indication that there were any problems with the aircraft. There was no contact uh, prior, any Mayday signals. Uh, the aircraft had made normal con contact with uh, the control center at uh, 1915. The last reported contact was at 1917. So nobody yet knows why the Pan Am flight crashed. Tonight, around 10 crash investigators from the Department of Transport are on their way to the scene. A Boeing team and USA Safety Board team are also on their way. In our Glasgow studio is Jim Ferguson, the aviation correspondent for Flight International. Uh, Mr. Ferguson, it seemed just to fall right out of the air. No mayday signal. It vanished right off the screens when it was travelling around 31,000 feet. What then do you think are the options? What are the possible causes of the crash? Well, we're looking at something catastrophic. It could be a structural failure. It could possibly be sabotage. They've ruled out the possibility of a, a mid-air collision, but obviously it's much too early yet to say. Uh, what, in the way of bad weather, would threaten a, a Boeing 747 under normal circumstances? At that height, you shouldn't get anything at all. It is blustery up here, it's very windy. But at that sort of height, only catastrophic clear air turbulence, which would be very, very rare indeed. At lower level, you get things like wind shear and microbursts, but obviously with the aircraft at that sort of height, we, I think we can rule these out. What are the possibilities of structural failure on a Boeing 747? It's a possibility, and obviously until the accident investigators have sifted through the wreckage, and that's going to be a monumental task given the scatter, it's going to take some considerable time, I think, to come up with this. 
Equally, there has been in the past uh, one or two problems with the 747, but modifications were instituted, and the aircraft has flown on for getting on for 20 years without really serious problems. Uh, officials are tending to rule out the idea of a mid-air collision, but it is a busy air route, isn't it? They do turn over Lockerbie, uh, and also military aircraft use that area. The military chaps tend to be at very low level, which is a problem to the local residents. But at that sort of altitude, there shouldn't be an air traffic problem. There is a, a beacon at Dean Cross, about 25 miles to the south of the crash locus. And as I say, the uh, authorities have said that there were no other aircraft in the area at the time. Mr. Ferguson, you mentioned sabotage. That's a possibility. We understand that there are American servicemen on board, and I would imagine that there are people around the world who are not terribly happy with the Americans, and it must be a possibility. Mr. Ferguson, thanks very much indeed. Buckingham Palace issued a statement a short time ago. It said the Queen was shocked and appalled by the disaster. She's been kept informed as more details of the tragedy emerge. The government are to make a statement in the Commons tomorrow, and the Scottish Secretary, Malcolm Rifkind, is on his way to the scene of the disaster. A Downing Street spokesman said Mrs Thatcher was very shocked indeed by this terrible disaster. She had telephoned the United States Ambassador, Charles Price, to express sympathy for the families of American victims of the crash. The Labour leader, Neil Kinnock, said the whole country would be devastated by the tragic loss of life. Until the aircraft's black box flight recorder is recovered, investigators will have little idea of what caused the crash. Our aviation correspondent Christopher Wayne looks at the possible explanations for the disaster. The Boeing 747 is the world's biggest commercial airliner and it has one of the safest records. Well over 800 have been built or are on order and they've been in use with every major airline. Until three years ago, no jumbo had been lost in mid-flight. But then came two disasters in quick succession. In June 1985, an Air India jumbo en route from Canada to London was blown apart high over the Atlantic. All 329 passengers and crew were killed. An investigation found the disaster had been caused by a bomb planted in the hold. Two months later, a 747 belonging to Japan Airlines on an internal flight from Tokyo came down in the mountains. Investigation revealed that pressurized air had leaked from a faulty pressure bulkhead into the tail and blown off the tail fin and wrecked the controls. 520 passengers died. Sabotage will certainly be one of the possibilities being investigated in tonight's crash, but mid-air collision and structural failure will be higher on the list. Mid-air collision at the moment seems unlikely. Air traffic controllers don't believe any other aircraft was in the vicinity and certainly none showed up on radar. Structural failure is a different matter. It's understood the 747 which crashed tonight was delivered in 1970, which means it was one of the earliest to come into service. There have been numerous examples of stress, corrosion and fatigue in older jets, some of which have been in major components. Every time these are discovered, the makers put out warning bulletins and the faulty parts are replaced. If the cause was structural failure, for example caused by flying into extreme turbulence, the chances are the wreckage will be very widely scattered. But, as always, there are puzzles. At least two eyewitnesses have spoken of the plane being on fire before it hit the ground, and one spoke of an initial impact three miles from the village. It'll be some time before the full story is known. That will become clearer when the flight data recorder is recovered from the tail section. The recorder will provide a three-dimensional picture of the flight profile from the moment it took off. Once it's been taken to Farnborough for analysis, the story behind the disaster will begin to emerge. The BBC reporter Ian Pronovich, uh, who you saw actually on the scene in Lockerbie early, earlier in our report uh, this evening, is in our studio in Carlisle. Ian, any evidence uh, yet of the number of casualties? It looks as though there were no survivors on the plane. What about the people in the town of Lockerbie? Well, it'll be very difficult to say how many casualties there are. Um, that won't become clear until well into tomorrow, if then. The scene is one of utter devastation. There is debris from the aircraft over several hundred yards, if not miles. Some people talk about an eight-mile um, swathe of, of devastation, even that another village outside Lockerbie um, uh, is blazing, but, of course, that's unconfirmed. But obviously there is great confusion in the area and certainly great devastation. There are cars on the A74 dual carriageway which connects Carlisle with Glasgow, and the the doors are still closed. Obviously the occupants uh, couldn't get out and were covered by burning fuel. That's what uh, the firemen on the scene are saying.
There are rescue teams converging on Lockerbie from all over the country. What are they, what are they doing? What are they able to do? Very little. Um, I was actually at the scene, as you saw there, uh, at the crater, and many of the firemen were sat around, not able to do anything at all. Um, they've, they obviously responded, but when the extent of the uh, disaster became apparent and, the, uh, and the, the force with which the plane came down, there really wasn't very much they could do after they put out the, uh, the blazing homes. So Lockerbie is, is a pretty devastated looking place tonight. It really is, yes, and people just can't believe that it's happened. There are, of course, people coming into the area to, to see what's happened, to, to, to see the site, and they're being warned to stay away, but it's, it's absolute confusion. Lorries um, jamming the roads, cars, ambulances moving into the area, but there's very little sign or evidence that they've actually been used to, to ferry casualties away, so that perhaps gives a hint at... Uh, uh, at what's happened, the fact that there may be many deaths, but uh, very few people who've actually been injured and, and have been taken to hospital. Yeah, one, one thing, uh, many people do talk of uh, this aircraft being uh, on, on fire before it came down. I was in a village about five miles to the south of, uh, of Lockerbie, and they were saying that they'd seen the aircraft go over very low, and it looked as though it was on fire. And certainly another eyewitness closer to the scene said it looked to be on fire before uh, the impact. So what that points to, I don't know, but um, one thought possibly is, is sabotage. It's known that there were American servicemen on the flight, so I don't know whether that can be ruled out or not, but certainly at the moment they, they don't appear to have found any large pieces of wreckage, and whether the black yeah. box will be found is another matter. Ian Pronovich and Carlisle, thanks very much indeed. And a final summary of tonight's tragedy. Pan American Airways uh, have confirmed in the last few minutes that there were no survivors. Uh, aboard the aircraft that crashed in the Scottish borders. It was a jumbo jet. It crashed on the town of Lockerbie between Dumfries and Carlisle. A Pan American Boeing 747 flying from Heathrow to New York. There were 244 people on board, including parties of American students and servicemen. Eyewitnesses say there was a huge fireball when the plane came down. A massive crater appeared, which was still on fire hours later. Several houses were demolished. Debris was scattered onto nearby roads and several cars were set on fire. Emergency services have rushed to the area. It's not yet known how many people have died, certainly 244 in the aeroplane, but it seems certain that tonight's crash will be Britain's worst air disaster. There are emergency phone numbers both here and in America. For London, they are 01, if you're outside London, 897-6333, 01. 897-6333. For people uh, in Lockerbie, Strathclyde Police can be contacted on 041, that's a Glasgow number, 041-204-0011. That's 041-204-0011. In America, the numbers are for Pan Am, 0101, that's what you dial from England, 0101. 800 -221 -1111. 0101-800-221-1111. 800-221-1111. And for the U.S. military, 01049-661-86851. Again, 01049-661-86851. I'll be back with the latest information on the crash after the film. BBC's Breakfast Time will be on the air at 6 o'clock.